Good morning. Welcome to Bethel this morning. Wherever you are, we welcome you. We have a few announcements. Last year, we did a special thing on All Saints Day. So we rang the bell after each name was read of a person who died in the past year. So we invite you to bring um, the name of your loved ones who have died. We also listed other family members and close friends of um, Bethel family. Please send your name, the name of your family members to Bethel um, to us by October 27. And um, again, um, my installation is going to be November 8th, so you are all invited. So it is at 3, 3 p.m. I invite you to uh, check your email so I will send more information to you next week. So let's take a deep breath together to allow the spirit that connects us with one another to be the spirit within us that allows us to see one another as human being, regardless of our flaws and perfection and the messy people we are. The spirit that gives life. The life when it's taken away from one affects all of us. We are here to receive Christ. We are called to proclaim Christ. We are sent to show Christ. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light and our salvation. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God. For in the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word, you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. To the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. To the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us our daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and we know our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our open hymn is on page five in your bulletin, You Are the Way.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, you are the holy lawgiver. You are the salvation of your people. By your spirit, we know us in your covenant of love and train us to care tenderly for all our neighbors through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The choir anthem, a mighty fortress. <laughs> first lesson is from the book of Deuteronomy, the 34th chapter, verses 1 through 12. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, and Naphtali, the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, the Negev, and the plain, that is, the Valley of Jericho, 
the city of palm trees, as far as Zoir. The Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants in his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Here ends the first lesson. Our psalm for today is Psalm 46. The cantor will sing the verses in plain type, and the congregation will sing the bold-faced verses. Jacob. 
The second lesson is from the first book of Thessalonians, the second chapter, verses one through eight. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise for mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. Here ends the second lesson. At this point in the service, we will continue with our prayer requests. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Let us pray for Renee, Bob, Neil and Linda, Al, Michaela, Bruce, Sophia, Ken, Virginia, Don, Art, Eileen, Jackie, Cecilia, Richard and Vicky, Ethel, Liam, Doris, Larry, Abby, Myrtle, Maria, Paul, Karen, Don, Tyler, Doris, Eloise, Tom, Carol, Bob, Ed, Crystal, Dolly, Ian, Kristen, Pat, Connor and family, Pamela, Susan, Neil, Deirdre, John and Colleen, Alyssa and finally Art. We pray for hope comfort, help and healing for all those whose lives have been affected by COVID-19. We remember especially those who are most vulnerable, the elderly, those with underlying conditions, medical care providers, and our siblings from the community of color. We ask for your care and safety, Lord, for all who are dealing with the wildfires here in California and Colorado. And we pray for the firefighters who are working to keep us safe. Give our church unity. Inspire all the baptized with the mind of Christ where the church is powerful and where it struggles. Shape us with humility and obedience so that your love may be at work in us. God of love, breathe on this fractured world and heal the divisions that grow daily wider, especially in Nigeria that the leaders might respect the right of all human beings to live in peace. We
we remember all the men, women, and families of those who put their lives on the line for others. And we ask that you would bless them as they serve to protect and help us. We pray for Cal California Lutheran University, the students and staff, that all may grow in wisdom and in their relationship with you. We pray for our church, Lord, for Pastor Mitch, our church council, our church staff members, our COVID-19 reopening committees, as they plan for us to safely gather in person. The Sierra Pacific Synod, Bishop Mark Holmerud, and the people of Bethel, as we worship and serve together. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold, enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David, he said to them, How is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet? If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions? The Gospel of the Lord. The sermon hymn is on page 9 in your bulletin. For by grace you have been saved.
How do we answer God's call to love our neighbor? Today's gospel reading from Matthew is another debate between Jesus and the Pharisees. The gospel is filled with a series of questions and responses. First, the Pharisees question Jesus about the greatest commandment in order to test him, and Jesus responds with the well-known words. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And then he goes on to add, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. When we think Jesus is done, he has some questions of his own. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? And the Pharisees get themselves tied into a big mess and ultimately are not able to adequately answer Jesus. So there are some interesting and intriguing questions being thrown around by Jesus and the Pharisees. When we first look at the passage, it seems like the primary message in this text is pretty easy. Love God and love your neighbor. You got it. I got it. You can do it. I can do it. No. If we really listen to and ponder the words Jesus is saying, I think this text has a little more to it than it first sounds like. Love God with all your heart. Okay, how do you do that? How do you love God with all your soul? How do you love with all your mind? The kind of love Jesus has in mind is of a fundamentally different quality than what we usually mean by love. The love presented here is not the love we can usually experience explicitly with our senses. Things we can touch, see, smell, taste, hear. How do we love God? Who we cannot experience explicitly with our senses. How do we experience God in general? Who is considered to be my neighbor? These are all questions that rise up and don't have any clear answers. So, Jesus' commandment, which is the core of this gospel passage, isn't nearly as straightforward as it first seemed. I think part of this has to do with the fact that Jesus doesn't answer the Pharisees' question in a very straightforward way. There are over 600 commandments in the Hebrew Bible. And the Pharisees are really challenging Jesus when they ask him which commandment of all, above all the rest is the greatest. And Jesus decides to go ahead and answer this question by naming not one, but two commandments from the Hebrew scriptures. The words that Jesus uses for the first part of this commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, come from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and make up part of the Jewish Shema, which means here. Some of you may know that the Shema is the most prominent prayer in the Jewish tradition. It is a prayer that serves as a cornerstone for the Jewish faith. 
So the first part of the commandment that Jesus gives was most likely no great surprise to the Pharisees. They've heard it before and know it well. However, what probably was a bit surprising to the Pharisees was the second commandment that Jesus lumps together with the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This commandment comes from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, and was a much lesser known commandment than the first one Jesus talks about. It's a bold move by Jesus to elevate this commandment to the level of the scripture that inspired the Shema. Jesus is really throwing a cover ball at the Pharisees. How can you put the love of neighbor on the same level as love of God? I think when we hear this passage in today's context, it's important to ask ourselves, what's at the center of our lives? We can begin to find the answer to this question by looking at how we decide to prioritize what's important to us collectively. It is time for us to reevaluate what makes us Christian. Five hundred forty five. Five hundred forty five children are now without their parents. These children came to the United States with their parents seeking refuge from crime and violence, from welfare and poverty, and were detained as criminals because of their status. They are alone with no one to care for them because their parents were deported in a system that treat immigrants as criminals. A system that exacerbates suffering rather than alleviating it. What is the foundation that makes us who we are? If we say it is our ethnic heritage that makes us the citizen of this country, if it is because of particular ideas on which we stand, this is legitimate in and of itself. But collectively, we must ask ourselves, as it separated us and moved us away from the true foundation, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, God's ultimate presence and grace and love. Is that love being shared? My friend and I were texting each other back and forth the other day, inquiring about each other's well-being. And at the end of our last text, she added, a whole new life, and it's 2020. How can we, the church of God and neighbor, in the midst of our time where everything is polarized and paralyzed, this isn't always an easy thing for us to do in this whole new life in 2020. It requires us to love the people around us even when it is most challenging for us to do. By requiring us to love all people, no matter how challenging or difficult it may be, Jesus is inviting us to fall back on an identity rooted simply in love. For that in God's own identity. We Christians seem to hear this message of love a lot, and I was really hoping to find something new and fresh to talk about this morning. But in today's passage, I don't think there is anything getting around the topic of love. And most important, there is no way of getting away from this love. This commandment, which upon further analysis, seems so difficult for us to fully accomplish by ourselves. 
only becomes possible when we remember that God is utterly committed to loving us. So my sibling, this morning this text reminds us that we are called, we are commended, if you will, by God to put the law of love above all else. To love our neighbors as ourselves. If only we can imagine ourselves in the faces of these children, the 545 of them, and their parents, and the other neighbors who seem so different and distant and unimportant to us, then we can see the plight and their hopes not as threats to us, but their journeys as our journeys too. We cannot do it alone, but the God who unites and loves us all equally can show us how. Because we are all immigrants in this land of the free and their hopes are our hopes under God. Amen. Let us profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered, and the Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrections of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The God of all grace, bless you now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. The closing hymn is on page nine in your bulletin. God's word is our great heritage. in peace. Be safe. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.